Hello, hello, hello. Good morning. My name is Mark Artiaga, and I'm on staff at the School of Social Work. I work in the office of the Vice Dean. And before I introduce our moderator, I'd like to share with you briefly um, why I am here today. When Dean Flynn first asked me to be on the All School Day Planning Committee, I was actually apprehensive at first. As a gay man, it just seems like I've spent the past 30 years of my life justifying my existence, which can just be a little exhausting. I can recall as a young boy, I was often called sweet or cute, but somehow along the way, people, whether it was classmates or my own family, changed and the words became sissy, faggot, effeminate. I would think to me at the time so, but eventually the taunts, the shoves, the attacks wore me down. I remember a specific incident in high school when I joined the cheerleading squad because I wanted to show my school spirit. Somehow my display of school pride was an affront to a group of jocks who thought they needed to show me a lesson. Imagine my confusion between their kicks and tightly bound hands around my neck as I thought, I'm just showing my school pride. What does that have to, what does that have to do with you? So I'm here today no longer apprehensive because the truth is there are numerous victims of hate like the Matthew Shepherds and the Gwen Arujos who no longer have the luxury of being alive today, like I do. And I know, like John Duran mentioned in his uh, keynote address, that the more we discuss our unique qualities and differences, we'll discover that we have so much more in common. So thank you all for being here. Today, the moderator of our panel is Ian Stolberg. He is a graduate of the UCLA School of Social Welfare and is also a part-time faculty member here at the USC School of Social Work. He teaches a popular survey course on GLBT issues. He has spent the majority of his professional life working with and writing about HIV and gay and lesbian communities. His master's research, the psychosocial impact of the AIDS epidemic on the lives of gay men was subsequently published in Social Work. Ian has worked for a, new, for a number of years on inpatient immune suppressed units and for over seven years was a manager of mental health for AIDS Service Center in Pasadena. Ian currently works for the LA Gay and Lesbian Center, one of the world's largest LGBT organizations as the director of mental health services. Please uh, extend a warm welcome to Ian. Thank you, Mark. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, I had no idea it was going to be so huge, though. I was thinking maybe 20 or 30 people we were talking to today, so I'm a, a little overwhelmed. Um, but it's great. I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to have all of you here today, even though you were required to be here. <laughs> um, I have to also say, uh, on a more personal note, that it, this has been an extremely enlightening event for me already. Um, as a mental health professional uh, over the years, I have heard of various um, uh, mental health cures for homosexuality. There's the psychoanalytic cure and there's the behavioral modification cure. But after listening to John Duran today, this is the first time I've heard of the Disneyland cure for homosexuality. <laughs> Guess I haven't heard of it because it was such a miserable failure, apparently, John, huh? Okay. Um, okay, I was asked to be the, the moderator today. The, the organizing committee um, presented me with a, a list of, of various questions that they came up with that they would like um, me to present to uh, the panelists. Um, but I've also um, asked the panelists, um, a part of the, the organization is um, I will be introducing each panelist and ask them to spend uh, 10 minutes giving you a, a brief uh, personal background as it relates to the LGBT community. And then given that you are all social work students, or as we used to refer to ourselves, you know, social workers in training or SWITs when I was at UCLA, um, I've asked them also to respond to the question if you had to identify one, one thing that you think it is important for future social workers to know about working with 
um, the LGBT community, uh, what might that be? Um, just to provide a little social worky focus uh, for the day's events. Um, so, um, but before I, I introduce the panelists, um, I wanted to provide a, just a brief historical perspective on, on today's events. Um, the, the LA Gay and Lesbian Center um, is now in its 37th year. Um, and the mental health program, which I'm the director of, was around at the very beginning. It was one of two services created initially by what was then called the Gay Community Services Center, Mental Health and Youth Services. And the group, there was a group of volunteers who, who were putting together what was to become the Mental Health Services Program. And this group of volunteers made a decision back in 1971 to create a peer oriented counseling program rather than a professionally oriented counseling program. Now, I think one, one reason for that was that this was 1971, and coming out of the 60s, there were a lot of community-based social service organizations created with a peer volunteer model. Um, so that, I think that was, that was common um, for that era. But the other reason they chose to create a peer rather than a professionally oriented mental health program was because in 1971, if you were an open gay man or lesbian, you could lose your license to practice mental health. There's a famous incident um, at the, uh, the National Convention of the American Psychiatric Association, um, and I think it was in 1971 or maybe 1972. They had a panel on homosexuality, and on this panel was a gay man who was a psychiatrist who was speaking about his experience as a gay man and a psychiatrist. And this gentleman spoke to the convention wearing a Halloween mask because if his identity was known, he could have lost his license to practice um, his profession. Um, now, I realize to many of you in the audience, 1971 was ancient history. Most of you probably weren't even born then. But for this aging homosexual, I was an adult in 1971. I was a young adult, you know, very young adult. I was only 21. <laughs> but I was still an adult, and, and the notion that within my adult lifetime, had I chosen at 21 to go into the social work profession, I would either have had to be in the closet about my sexual orientation, or I would have risked losing my ability uh, to be a social worker in, in the community. And it is still mind-boggling to me that, that uh, a profession or society could tell me, you don't qualify to be a mental health professional just because you're a gay man. It still boggles my mind. Now, we've made a dramatic strides in the last 37 uh, years, and today the mental health program is exclusively a professionally oriented mental health program. We don't have peers at this time. We have 15 clinicians on staff, and we have a huge internship program. My intern, Michelle, is here today. Um, hi, Michelle. Um, <laughs> we, have, we have some 40 masters and doctoral level uh, mental health interns, and as, a, as an, another mark of the progress we've made, um, I think a good 25% of those interns identify as straight. And so some people are kind of surprised to know you have straight interns at the Gay and Lesbian Center. Yes, actually we do. And occasionally we even have the brave heterosexual male intern too. And, and, in, fact, in fact, a couple of years ago, um, we had a, a heterosexual couple who met as interns at the Gay and Lesbian Center, and they went on to get married. So when I was in charge of the, of the clinical training program and I would go out to universities to recruit, I would, I would use that as a recruiting device. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would say, if, if you're a straight, single man and you want a relationship, you couldn't do a better internship than the Gay and Lesbian Center. There's always plenty of women around. There's no competition. <laughs> and, and to top it off, you automatically get extra points for being a sensitive straight man who's not intimidated <laughs> by being here with a gay and lesbian center. But I digress. OK. Um, so uh, we have made uh, dramatic strides in, in the 30-some years uh, uh, since the center was first created. I do want to hasten to add, however, that um, we're going to be hearing uh, from Sharon um, uh, in a minute. Um, 
the strides, you know, I think frequently we, we refer to the LGBT community because it's convenient. And, and of course, because we share many things in common. But in many respects, it is not a, a um, one community, it's, it's many. And the issues um, in, impacting the LG uh, folks um, are not necessarily the same issues that impact the T's. And I think in many respects, the transgender community, um, you know, their, their position in, in society is still a couple of decades behind uh, where uh, lesbians and gay men have been able to achieve. And, and, and Sharon will probably tell you, um, it is still, it is still to this day a very common occurrence that somebody can be fired strictly for being a transgender individual. So that's still something that's with us today. Um, okay, so uh, enough of the historical context. Now, so before we get to the questions that the committee has asked me to, to ask, I'd like to introduce uh, the panel briefly. You have their, their bios in your program, so I won't spend time go going into them um, at, at any length. Um, we have Rita Gonzalez with us, who is a longtime community activist, a couple decades of activism within the LGBT community and the Latino community. Uh, Sharon Brown, um, a, a transgender activist and my coworker at the Again Lesbian Center, working in human resources. And uh, Neil Thomas, um, who's the senior pastor at Metropolitan Pen Community Church and one of the best speakers around town. Um, and Miguel, Miguel, I'm just Miguel Martinez, I'm sorry. Miguel Martinez, who's also a social worker, uh, works for Children's Hospital with their high risk youth program. So, um, I'm going to ask each individual to uh, please introduce themselves. Just take about 10 minutes, give a little background, and then if you could respond to the, to the question, um, one thing that's important for these folks to know about working with the community. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to say John took a lot of my lines that I was going <laughs> to say. Um, being a woman, being a Latina and being a lesbian have, have been challenges through my life, but uh, they've been great, actually. They, they made me the person that I am today. And before I start, I do want to say that uh, as a growing up in my early teens, one person that was very influential in my life was a social worker because she, it wasn't just a job for her. She really cared about me, and she helped me make life choices, and I, I really thank her for that. So wanted to put that out there. And also to confuse a little bit more, there are more acronyms. There's LGBT, IQ, TS. People forget about TS, Two-Spirit, two which is what the Native Americans use. So, and I is for intersex, Q, square, question mark, and questioning and queer. So you're going to hear so many acronyms. I mean, it's getting so big now that, I mean, you can't even put it on a t-shirt anymore. <laughs> so it's... So there's all kinds of things you'll hear out there, but now you know what TS is. Um, my activism actually, well, I first want to tell you, where I first came out, it was a very trying experience for me. I, I grew up in downtown Los Angeles, so I am also from uh, Los Angeles. I'm a native person, so it was a lot different from, from various things. Very, very Catholic, very Latino um, family. So being a lesbian, I didn't even know what a lesbian was. I didn't even know what the word was, lesbian. But I knew I had feelings that I just didn't know quite what they were, and, and they were they were really uh, disrupting my life. The person who outed me, though, however, was my mother. My mother told me what it was, and it's not something that she accepted, but she did say, uh, told me that I was a lesbian, and she actually explained it to me. So. Um, so, you know, parents do know. If you think you're hiding something from your parents, and I wasn't hiding it from my mother, but she, she said it was something that she always knew. My first time to be discriminated as a lesbian, because I've had different challenges being a woman. I've had a lot of discrimination as a woman and as being a Latina. But the first time I was discriminated as a lesbian, I was going into a nightclub. Now, I was a professional woman, made good money, and I was standing in line, and a, a group of... Um, college students drove by because it was Dinah Shore, so that's where uh, a lot of people go. And in and and those days, it was spring break, the same time colleges and, and Dinah Shore, so you had a lot of mixed uh, groups there. And somebody threw a beer bottle at me. And I didn't know why they did that, because I thought, I don't know this person. 
and he threw a beer bottle at me. So it started me thinking things that, you know, what, there is a discrimination out there that people don't understand who I am, and I'm a human being. I'm just like you and them. I vote. I don't cross, the, don't walk cross. I mean, I do everything that I'm supposed to do. And uh, that's the first time that, that it happened. So I was much aware that there was a discrimination. The first time I got involved with uh, activism is at the Gay and Lesbian Center. Um, I was a phone installer. And I had to go to the Gay and Lesbian Center to install telephones. I didn't even know there was a Gay and Lesbian Center. And I didn't know that um, gays and lesbians actually got together and did political things. I thought we just partied all the time. So I knew all the, bar I knew all the bars were all the back streets and things like that. But these were people that were like um, getting to, I mean, this was a business. And they were having, a, they were going to a dinner. They, you, know, you know, I started talking to them. We had discussions and different things. And I told them I was a lesbian. And, uh, and then they were saying, you know, there's so many things out there that, you know, political movements and various things out there. So uh, uh, they invited me to a dinner. I thought, wow, gays and lesbians go to dinners. And because, uh, you know, I just knew the bars. And I went to this political dinner and everybody's dressed in tuxedos and, and dresses. And I thought, wow, there, there was a life out there besides the bars. And there was a lot of things happening out there. So that really was an awakening for me. The first organization that I got involved with was uh, GLU, Gay and Lesbian Latinos Unidos. Now, Gay and Lesbian Latinos Unidos was the first Latino organization, co-gender, that started in 1981 by UCLA students. And it was uh, mostly made up of men, but they didn't want to call themselves GU, so they thought <laughs> they might as they need to invite women to this thing, so it sounded better, Gay and Lesbian Latinos Unidos. So, <laughs> It's true. <laughs> but, uh, so, um, and it was an organization that was co-gendered. A lot of uh, Latinos and Latinas felt that they didn't mix with, with the general population of, of gays and lesbians because we didn't hang out in West Hollywood. We didn't hang out in various places. And a lot of them, you know, were, had identity uh, things that they were dealing with, plus cultural and, and various things like that. So this, this was a social, board, a social organization that was educational also. So it was a great place for for um, Latinos to get together. In fact, we used to have um, retreats once a year up in the mountains. And we got to, now, Latinos, you think you just throw us in a lump sum, we're all Latinos. We're not. We come from different cultural backgrounds. I mean, I'm from LA, so they don't even consider me a Latino half the time, because I'm a pocha. So, you know, so they, you know, and these are cultural things you have to deal with. Uh, people from Costa Rica don't have the same experience as someone from Mexico or from Los Angeles. So these are the, the experiences that we really shared with each other and, and really bonded. From there, um, uh, the AIDS crisis happened. Now, it was being addressed by APLA and various organizations. AIDS Project Los Angeles was, was the first one on board to start dealing with, with the AIDS crisis. However, there was a lot of cultural problems there because they didn't understand people. People of color were also getting AIDS, and a lot of them did speak the language. Uh, African Americans were also getting AIDS, uh, AIDS and there, there didn't seem to be any, any place for them to feel comfortable at. Now remember, there were, there, you know, we may be all gay and lesbian, but we weren't joined. We all had our groups that we did, um, did a lot of our work in. So Minority AIDS Project started with the Reverend Carl Bean, and he came to GLUE and asked if he can do a, a 501 under our, um, our nonprofit status, which we, we gave him, he shared it under our umbrella to start Minority AIDS Project. So he was doing something in the African American community, but he was also doing in the Latino community, and we said, well, if he's doing the Latino community, we're a Latino com organization, why don't we do something for our own people? And that's where we started Bienestar, which I am, um, been a member of Bienestar for since the conception of it. It was, um, it's, now we started with a storefront, and Dennis Star is for primarily Latinos, monolingual, or in just various um, places around the, uh, the city. We have nine centers now. We started with just one little center in Silver Lake, and now we have nine centers. And we don't deal with just gays. We deal with women getting AIDS, men. Um, a lot of people, like men don't identify with being gay. It's men having sex with men, MSM they call it. And a lot of men were having, um, were being picked up by truck drivers and going home and giving their wives AIDS. You know, because they're out in the, the laborers out there trying to get a job. It's not just at Home Depot. They're at various, they get picked up for doing other things besides painting a house. 
a lot of times they're, they're being uh, picked up for, for, for sex. And these men are married, and they come home and they give their wives AIDS. So we have various programs. We have programs for, stu for, for youth to also educate them in AIDS and, and let them know that there's other things out there. So I've had the, fort the fortune to be involved with Benistar. And I do uh, do also add that I also do a radio show, which is gay and lesbian, and it's been on the air since 1975 here in Los Angeles on KPFK. And by doing the show, I've been with them from, since 1985, and I have, and I'm blessed because I meet some really great people here, and, and John, and, and various people in the community that are that are dealing with with gay issues because it's not over. I mean, being out still isn't safe for a lot of people, so people are still coming to terms with it. They still can't go home and tell mom and dad that they're gay. I mean, I was fortunate, but not everyone is that fortunate. So I have that opportunity to meet some wonderful people doing some wonderful things in the community, and not here just in Los Angeles, but nationally, internationally now. And um, it's, is my time up? <laughs> okay, so uh, I can go on and on for about different things, but I just wanna say that there's so many resources here in Los Angeles. If you don't know of something, you can find, find it on the website, and if you're, we're also fortunate to have the one institute, which is just down on Adams Street. I don't know if you've been there, 9, 909 Adams. There is an LGBT archives there that has everything that you ever wanted to know about the gay community here in Los Angeles and beyond. So that's, I'm just going to close with that. But keep your minds open because there are so many places for resources. Thank you. Yep. Sharon? Well, first of all, uh, let me see, and I don't really know where to start because uh, I am not from California. <laughs> and to me, this is like walking into Oz, Emerald City, because your rights are so much liberal. I am from uh, rural Louisiana. I'm from the Deep South. <laughs> exactly, we're gay, lesbian, uh, transgender, you know, didn't exist. Uh, in the minds of the people there. But one of the things that um, set me apart, since we're talking about our personal experiences, is growing up being black, not gay, but effeminate, and, but perceived to be gay, was very difficult. And I was growing up in the times of, I don't want to give my age, but... <laughs> <laughs> But during the time uh, growing up, uh, you know, in high school, everyone perceived me to be gay. But I was, I'm not gay. I never was and never proclaimed to be gay. But as I continue to grow up and go off to college and to the military, eventually, um, I was very young when I, said, I, when I decided that enough's enough. I decided I wanted to live my life as the woman that I felt that I am. So the big thing was how I was going to tell my parents this. Being black, and I am not trying to take any away from any other group or culture, but uh, at certain times, as we've spoken before, you've heard it before, at different times, uh, being gay was considered a white phenomenon. Okay? There was no such thing as being gay within the black community. So when we began to start to accept homosexuality. And then we want to throw something on top of it that, oh, she's transgender? No. So what happened was that I told my parents, and what you probably already expect, and I was disowned. And we didn't speak for 18 years. And we just now recently started talking. Um, but, you know, it's what has uh, taken place throughout that time, those 20 years, you know, the military, uh, completion of college. Uh, I went on working at a university, Fayetteville State University in North Carolina. I was there a couple of years working as a resident hall director. No one knew. Uh, and, it was, and when it was discovered that I was a transsexual, I was fired. Although everyone wants to say that it was a, uh, 
it was a sexual orientation issue for some people from, from, from the straight community that wasn't aware. And from the gay community, I got, oh, it's not a gay issue. And the legal battle came into play. But what was so strange about that is that everyone, my attorneys, wanted me to fight it based on sexual orientation because I have a better chance. But that wasn't the case. I identify and always has identified and always will identify as a heterosexual female. The issue at hand was gender identity, but there was no protection for gender identity. Uh, and the gay community at that particular time, and still now, but we were, they're much more <laughs> welcoming, still we don't understand gender identity and where we fall in that rainbow because the issue is totally different. So um, at that particular time, uh, I was not given permission to sue. The EOC said no. Nope. And simply because of the fact that it is not a recognized form of discrimination. Uh, and you know, if, even today, you can be fired based on gender identity. Uh, someone is decided they want to transition and they say, well, they may be gay, and you might perceive them to be gay. And it's, well, I'm not firing you because you're gay. I'm firing you because of your gender identity. You know, I'm, I'm firing because you don't meet the standard of what we identify as to be gender, male or female. So um, as things went on, uh, of course, I started my uh, activism right there at Fayetteville State. It was not a pretty sight. Uh, I was escorted off the campus. Of course, the whole school was out there lined up. You know, the media was there. Uh, the whole thing was everybody wanted to see where is um, the man that's dressed up like a woman. Although I have been uh, at your side, in your classrooms, in your resident hall, each and every day, and you never knew. So one of the things that uh, I wanted you to challenge you with is that everyone, for some reason, thinks they can tell. And I think that's what was the whole fearful thing about this university. And keep in mind, this university is an HBC, which is a historical black college. So when I was turned away from that college, I was turned away from much more than just the idea of being a diverse uh, institution. I was turned, it was like my race was saying no. My family had already told me no. Now my race, the universe has built on change and acceptance of change said no. And that let me know right then and there that gender identity, it crosses all boundaries and it's very scary to everyone. And regardless of the fact of race, culture, it's there and it's something that we have to face. So, and I faced it alone, but I'm here today to talk about it. Uh, but with that, at that school right now, they have, uh, their policies hasn't changed as drastic as here. Uh, there still, there's no anti-discrimination policy based on gender identity. However, there are um, more competency meetings being held among the students. So the change is a little bit slow in the South. Yeah. Um, but from there, I went on. I entered the arena of politics. I ran for city council in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina as an openly uh, transsexual. Uh, did very well. Didn't win the seat. <laughs> Didn't expect to win the seat. But what happened was, and uh, it was the first time that the incumbent mayor and a couple of the other city council members was forced to campaign within the gay bars. And with, it, it, it was amazing. I mean, I'm like, we're looking around, and here comes the mayor into the uh, gay bar. I'm like, what are you doing? You want somebody to call you daddy? You know, and I wasn't quite sure, you know. But, but it was like... <laughs> It was a, I mean, he was in there, and he was actually campaigning because the issue was brought to the forefront. And uh, 
And from there, that brings me here. Um, of course, I am a survivor from Hurricane Katrina. I moved back home to New Orleans, and uh, right after the hurricane, I left and eventually found my way here to South, not South Carolina, uh, California. Uh, and I've been here now for a year, and uh, you know, so far I'm enjoying it. And I'm really glad you guys uh, invited to have me here. Well, my name's uh, Neil Thomas, and I didn't grow up in Southern California either. Um, and uh, Honorable John uh, Duran gets to call, be called Daddy, I get to be called Reverend Daddy. Um, <laughs> and it's a term of endearment and one that I thoroughly enjoy uh, embracing. <laughs> As I said, I grew up in uh, Great Britain um, and uh, moved to Southern California seven years ago to resume my responsibilities as the senior pastor of the Metropolitan Community Church of Los Angeles, which is the founding church of an international denomination reaching out and beyond the LGBTQ community, uh, Q-I-T-S-A-B-C-D-E-F-G. Um, and have the absolute honor of pastoring uh, the founding church here in Los Angeles, now centrally located in West Hollywood for the current time. Um, MCC was founded primarily for the LGBT community, specifically to um, provide a safe haven for those who were in other denominations, other Christian churches, who were being ostracized because of their sexual identity or their sexual orientation and who were being constantly asked to either be quiet or to leave their former traditions uh, because they believed that somehow the Bible condemned homosexuality. Um, well, not necessarily homosexuality, but certainly the practice of it. Um, my famous uh, line to most of my colleagues who tell me I should not be a practicing homosexual is that I actually am no longer a practicing homosexual. I'm very good at it. and of many years of experience of fine-tuning those skills of what it means to be a homosexual. Um, MCC was founded uh, prior to the Stonewall Riots uh, in New York, uh, which really birthed uh, the gay rights liberation movement here in the United States of America. Um, and Stonewall, for those of you who perhaps don't know, was the opportunity when uh, a group of drag queens and leather dykes and boys and girls uh, said enough is enough when the police kept arresting people or going into the bars and uh, arresting folks purely based on their sexual orientation and the places that they chose to, to meet. Um, and so out of that came the gay liberation movement that we now know today that is the LGBTQI, et cetera, et cetera, community. But MCC was always being this both political and religious organization, uh, working for the rights of LGBT people who want to have a spiritual community and a spiritual faith and also uh, wanting to uh, win rights, the human rights, uh, for lesbian and gay people wherever we happen to exist. And of course, my experience was in Great Britain. Um, I grew up in a traditional Christian family. Actually, I grew up in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is the Mormon tradition. Um, my family were some of the early converts to Mormonism um, in the United Kingdom. And uh, we grew up uh, within, that, within that structure. Anyone knows anything about the Mormon tradition? Um, Mormons are very white. Uh, very misogynist, uh, misogynistic, and um, uh, very religious uh, in their upbringing. Uh, to spend three or four hours a day on a Sunday in church is um, you know, not unknown and not uncommon. Um, and most of my, I have five brothers and one sister, um, and I have an identical twin brother. Um, I know that's some, some gay man's fantasy somewhere. Um, <laughs> but a very religious structure. And to put that into some context for you, um, here in the United States, it is recorded that about 56% of the population attend church, temple, or synagogue um, on, a, on a Sabbath, on, on their holy day. Um, in Great Britain, that's about 5%. Um, so we're, although we are you know, a nation that is intrinsically linked to religion and, and state, um, we're very non-religious um, in our upbringing. But Mormonism came in and uh, attracted a lot of people, and fundamentalist Christianity, I think, was really rebirthed um, in the Mormon movement um, in the United Kingdom. I say all of that because then, you know, as a, a, a teenager, um, I discovered that I was different. Um, by that, I meant that I had some attraction to men rather than to women. 
And all my older siblings um, were kind of dating women and getting married, and you know, I was the youngest, along with my twin brother. Um, and my twin brother was starting to date women, but I had no interest whatsoever. In fact, I had far more interest in you know, what, using the showers after sports than actually doing sports themselves. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, would, I would get out of my house at night and go to gay bars and gay clubs. Um, we don't have IDs in the UK, so we can get in anywhere that we want to without really, really, really worrying. Um, and I was uh, you know, very sexually active um, as a young man. Um, I think my first sexual encounters were probably too young, um, thinking back. <laughs> but they brought a smile to my face. <laughs> So, um, so, you know, so, so, by the time I was, um, by the time I was 15, I was incredibly sexually active, and um, my twin brother got very, very concerned about my sexual activity. Perhaps I was getting more than he was, or something. But, um, you know, he he spoke to one of our school teachers uh, that you know I was having sex with men, and uh, my school teacher went to tell my headmaster, who then phoned the police. And the police came to the school, and as a 15-year-old boy, adolescent, I was escorted from the school premises um, and taken to a prison cell uh, until my mother uh, was able to come and, and get me. Now, of course, I should tell you that the reason why I was escorted to a prison cell was because I was having an affair with a police officer at the time. And, um, of course, that was a, a big no-no. And um, thankfully, my mother convinced my brother to drop all the accusations. Of course, they weren't true, and um, I was released. I've never seen that police officer from that day to this, which is a, a deep regret, because he was my first love. And anyone who knows anything about first loves, they're very special um, in your life. But I've never seen him from that day to this. But it was at that moment that I knew what my identity was. And that has been my identity for all of these years. I'm a self-proclaimed gay man, who as I get older realizes that to be gay doesn't, has a, a huge spectrum on the gender and sexual identity planes. And as a 41-year-old man, I now understand that sexuality is very fluid too. And surprise, surprise, at 41, I actually find women very attractive. Never slept with one yet. <laughs> but I find them very, very attractive, yeah. Always leave that one open. <laughs> And, and herein lies the big problem, because, because, because for those of us who are religious, the big problem is the integration of spirituality and sexuality. And for those of us who are brought up in traditional Christian churches or, or in any kind of community of faith, sex has always been seen as sin. And for, for those of us who are homosexual, um, we're the easy target because we identify as approximately 10% of the population, always have done, always will do. God's order. Um, but that means that those who are, by orientation, heterosexual, scapegoat sexual sin onto the homosexual community because there are the expendable 10% that don't need to be integrated into the life of Christian community. Now, of course, I think that because gay, gay, gay people, LGBT people, have now claimed their bodies and claimed what it means to be a self-identified um, person, that means that the Christian church specifically has to then start to look at the sexual sin that goes on behind the doors of Mr. and Mrs. Average that we see in churches on Sundays, but who men beat up during the week or abuse their women um, or who are having inappropriate sexual relations with their children. And provided that you present homogenous, happy married couple, everything's fine. And the gay community has really challenged that perception of human sexuality for the Christian church. And I believe that homosexuality within the Christian church is the last bastion for full human rights, full religious rights uh, within the Christian community. And they will fight us, dominant culture will fight us 
for as long as it can do because we represent something that will mean the change for the Christian church in the long term. So, what can we learn? What do social workers need to know? I think what social workers really need to know is that many, many LGBT people that you will, you will come into contact with are very damaged, um, have very low self-esteem, and who, although we may present as gay, happy, um, you know, why did you steal my word? Um, although we may present that way, there are the internalized homophobic issues going on inside of our lives every moment of the day. My, my first um, real homophobic attack happened when I moved to Southern California seven years ago. Um, it was in West Hollywood, which is where my parish is. I was walking down the street with my boyfriend, my boyfriend who was my boyfriend at the time. We move on. Um, <laughs> And as I was, we were holding hands, we were walking along the street, and a car went by, and somebody shouted at, at me, faggot. Well, my colleague comes from Wales. Um, we know what a faggot is in the UK. It's a meat dish. Here in the United States, it's a derogatory term for a homosexual. And my instant reaction to that abuse was to shout back at the car, tell me something I don't know. But I realized that in that moment there was some damage that was still in my body that needed to be healed. And those internalized homophobia issues come up for us over and over again, even, the most, even some of the most progressive societies. And so what I would suggest to, to, to social workers as we deal with you know, homosexuality and, and the clients that we get to deal with is to understand that those internalized homophobic issues and those issues of low self-esteem will come out in so many different ways. In our community at the moment, it comes out in the abuse of drugs, in the abuse of alcohol, in using substances to hide our inner feelings and to pretend that the world is really okay. Um, and at the root of all of those issues, for those of us in the United States of America, they come back to religious issues because the religious issues, the religious institutions in our, in our country have told us that we're worthless, that we're going to hell, and that we're of our own making. And when you hear that enough, not only will you begin to internalize it and believe it, but you'll begin to behave like it. So I would encourage you to really look at those issues, especially when you're dealing with LGBT people. Religious, internalized homophobia, and self-esteem. So I feel like I have a really hard act to follow. I'm, I'm sitting up here with uh, three individuals who, you know, have such legacy, and and thinking about, you know, how important our personal identities are to. Um, Informing what we might say later on the panel, I think, um, as I as I heard uh, Mr. Dran earlier, you know, I was one of those queer um, young gay men in the Bay Area um, in 1991, uh, who had been basically disowned by my family, um, was putting myself through school at Berkeley, and was challenged by HIV, challenged in um, what. At the time, um, for those of you that are around my age, I'm around 35, uh, young gay men in the Bay Area were being told that research was showing that I think about 30% of us were going to be positive. They were, you know, it was this sort of horrific doomsday tale of, of what was to come. And, you know, I think as a young person, we are uh, experiencing our lives and, and in terms of coming out, you know, experiencing all, all of the lovely things that that means. Um, had the, uh, I guess, good fortune of meeting a man by the name of Galen Martinez, who was, um, same last name as me, but no relation, uh, the brother of a really good friend in, at Berkeley, who passed away from HIV my freshman year. And at the time, hearing these research studies and sort of feeling like, well, what can I do? You know, what can I do to be part of this? I'm a young person who um, doesn't have 
at the time I thought, anything to give. So what am I going to do? I'm going to get involved, and I volunteered for an agency by the name of L.A. Shanti, um, not L.A. Shanti, but Shanti, San Francisco Shanti, which at the time provided emotional and practical support for mainly men who were dying of AIDS. Um, so I was 19 years old, had been trained, trained, right, <laughs> to provide peer support for, um, you know, my, my community, and met my first uh, placement uh, on a Saturday, passed away on a Sunday, um, and volunteered for about five years. Um, probably really one of the more amazing experiences I've had has really, uh, I think, informed uh, the way that I approach social work. Um, at its core, taking care of people in their hours of need. Um, these were, uh, you know, mainly men in their 30s, white gay men. Um, you know, I was a little Latino from Southern California with not a lot of economic clout, um, but uh, was able to give something back to what I thought, you know, at the time was my community. So I say that in, in that, um, you know, again, it's about our identity politics. You know, I am a queer gay man. Um, I've been with my partner since 2002, so almost 15 years. Uh, we married in San Francisco as a political act of defiance because we were told we couldn't. Um, and unlike the two of them, because of my age, I actually am a dad. Um, I adopted a child, uh, two, well, just finalized two weeks ago, but started the process almost two years ago. Um, and I think, you know, I think what's amazing about all of us is, and, and all of you, is we all come with all of our identities. And I think that's the piece when we think about what do we impart, and as a social worker, you know, what, what is that, that thing that I wish my colleagues knew? And it really is that, you know, early on, I think when you look at, like, for example, like women's studies or ethnic studies, it, they talk about the lens in which you look at people, those multiple identities, the issues of spirituality, the issues of race, the issues of gender and gender expression. Um, and, and sometimes I feel like we forget as a profession that history, that it's not enough to learn about the DSM. It's not enough to learn about community organizing principles and theories of behavior change. It's, it's the history of each community. It's constantly challenging yourself that the boxes that we've learned as young people are oftentimes quite rigid and don't allow for the fluidity in which people really experience their lives. I mean. I don't necessarily frequent bars in West Hollywood, but if I identify myself as a gay man, unfortunately that's oftentimes the image that people just assume things, not that it's a bad thing, but that they make assumptions based on one piece of your identity. So if you're gay, you're not Latino. If you're transgender, you're no longer black. You know, and, and when we think about the challenges of public health and social work today, um, today is National um, Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day. Um, and for those of you that have somehow not read a newspaper or turn on the TV or listen to the radio, um, the public health crisis amongst African Americans across our nation is humongous. Um, we now are hearing from all levels of government that it is a public health crisis, that we are um, in the midst of seeing devastation in particular communities. And, and, and again, when when you think about why is this happening, it's because, as a, I think, as professions, we've not um, appreciated the true lens in which we should look at one another. You know, you can't do public health interventions that simply see someone as a black person and deny their gender, their gender expression, their sexuality, their abilities and economics. So I think for me, as a social worker, it would be you know, challenge yourself, open books that you would no longer, you know, that you, you that as, as we leave institutions of higher education, we still have to learn, we still have to read, we still have to challenge ourselves, we have to meet people that make us uncomfortable, um, and I guess that's, that's where I'll, I'll leave my little, my little two cents. <laughs> yeah. Okay, th thank you. Thank you all. Um, I have a, a, a few questions that have been submitted to me by the organizing committee, and then um, I'll ask them, and then we will open it up to questions from the audience. I understand there will be a, a mic on either side of, of the room uh, that people can, can use if they have a question to, to ask. First, um, actually, Rita, I'm going to ask you a question that wasn't 
initially wasn't the one I, I had assigned to you, so I'm putting you on the spot here, but it's, it's not that hard. The, the question is, what are the strengths among the LGBTQ community that you have found in working uh, with this population? What, what particular strengths can you identify uh, within the community? I think strengths, um, caring about other people, um, because we, we can identify about being discriminated so we can be more compassionate on, 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 on working with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, and that is a strength. And, and we're, you know, we have our religion. We're still as religious as we were before we were gay. So I think uh, our faith also is, is, a, is a tremendous help in, in who we are. I'm sorry. I'm in transition here. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Speaking of transition, <laughs> um, Sharon, I actually, um, there was a question that was submitted, but I think you kind of addressed it already. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to present a, a question to you that um, is going to sound very ignorant, um, but I think the reality is it's a question that probably a lot of folks in the audience have and may feel too intimidated or uncomfortable uh, to raise. So I, it's something that I've often heard. I think people are very often confused about the difference between sexual orientation and gender identity. And they might look at you and say, well, if you were born with a penis and you found yourself attracted to men, you're a gay man. Um, why do you need to change yourself into a woman? Um, that must mean you have internalized homophobia and you just can't accept being a gay man. I've heard that, that attitude expressed before. I'm wondering if you could respond uh, to that. Okay. It's <laughs> a good question. Um, first, let me just say that most men, I would say the majority of men, whether gay or straight, can't understand why another man want to cut their penis off. Okay, they just really can't grasp that. <laughs> it can't. So, to answer that question, well, let me also cross to the other gender, so you can, uh, not just from uh, male to female or female to male. W women can't understand why another woman would want to cut her breasts off. So, that makes it very difficult when you're trying to express gender identity and sexual orientation. Because I have also been accused of, the, well, maybe you're internalized homophobic. But the difference is, is that at a very early age, I can say, uh, for me it's three or four around that, I knew I was different. It had nothing to do with who I was sexually attracted to. It was much more of who, um, who I am here. And I knew then, at that very young age, that I was a girl. I just happened to be a girl that had what my brother had, you know, a, a girl with a penis. And I'm like, why should I have this if, you know, my sisters have this? Because we're the same. So the question for sexual orientation never ever crossed my mind. It was never ever an issue of whether if I was gay or not. The only question that crossed my mind was when was I going to make my outward body appear to what my inner body was saying. So um, I know through perception when people say, well, you know, as long as that time for the 18 years or 19 years that you lived as a boy, and if you engage in sex with a man, and by, for the record, I was well over the age of 24 I first had sex. So, <laughs> so we can get that out of the way right now, okay? <laughs> okay, <laughs> well over the record, okay. <laughs> but people say, we want to say, well, if, you're, if, you're, if your physical anatomy matches that of the male, then you're gay. No, because gender identity is here and the, your sexual orientation is totally different whom you're attracted to. You're going to find a lot of 
uh, transsexuals. Uh, let me use the term transgender because that's a much more uh, recent term. Because when I started, it was transvestite, then the transsexual, and then they tag on transgender. So it's taking a little while to catch up to using the transgender term, but I will get there. So, <laughs> but um, a large percentage of when people first hear the word transgender, they automatically want to say that you're gay, or they want to say that um, they believe that they know what you look like, what you're going to look like, or were you this uh, heterosexual male who lived your life as a male, married, had kids, and now you want to transition. So there are going to be transgender who are gay, and there are going to be a transgender who are straight. Now, as uh, social workers, you will probably come encounter that the large percentage of transsexual that are female to male are gay. That is because genetically, yes, they were women and are women, genetically. We're talking about the physical anatomy. So when they transition to uh, have their outward appearance to appear how their gender size is male, they are men who are attracted to men. So in that situation, they are gay. And I hope I didn't confuse you, because I see a look on your eyes out there. What? <laughs> so. Good. Thank you. Uh, Neil, um, question. Can a social worker truly be non-judgmental, accepting, and effective in their clinical work if they are religiously identified and that religion is, in essence, judgmental, i.e., it sees homosexuality as sin. Um, I, the simple answer to this question, of course, is yes, because a lot of us are really, really good at compartmentalizing our lives. You know, we compartmentalize our religion, we compartmentalize our sexuality. We, you know, I mean, that's, that's how we're taught, and we're taught in a very binary system. Um, right, wrong, sin, good. Um, and so I think, sorry, you know, I'm not usually accused of having this problem. <laughs> um, so, so, I think, so I think, fundamentally, <laughs> lots of other problems, but not this one. Um, you know, I was a, I was a chaplain through the um, AIDS pandemic um, in the UK, and um, you know, this kind of takes me back to that whole era of religiosity when um, so many gay men specifically um, were dying and clergy from my tradition would not conduct funerals for them because they believed that they weren't worthy of a Christian funeral. Um, and I remember working with a group of chaplains in this AIDS hospice um, who, you know, I really believed had great compassion, great understanding, you know, professional ethics, et cetera, et cetera, um, about how, how do they deal with their feelings around homosexuality. And I, I remember meeting with this group of chaplains and saying, you know, dealing with your prejudices against homosexuality should not be done at the side of a bed of a patient who's dying with AIDS. And that if you can't deal with those issues separately and professionally and somewhere else, then there is no role for you as a chaplain in an AIDS hospice um, because you shouldn't be doing that kind of work. And, and I think that there's, there's the same case um, for those who are social workers. You know, if you, you're working out your own religious views about homosexuality should not be done in front of a client who happens to uh, you know, be homosexual or lesbian or bisexual or transgendered or whatever. Um, identity they, they bring. Your role as a person who is giving compassion and service is to be compassion and service and not to work out your own prejudices. Um, so yes, it's possible, but that means that you have to do that, that extraordinary piece of work. That means that you have to get over the prejudices that you have in your own life, in your own time, and with professionals who can help you do that. And if you do that in front of a client, then you have no right to be called a social worker. As they used to say on Family Feud, good answer, good answer. All right. um. uh, 
Okay. Miguel. How, um, question, how do we address the stigma associated with HIV AIDS within the LGBTQ community, especially within uh, the adolescent age group? So, so in thinking about the question, I think you have to think about the definition of stigma, right? It's a, it's a mark. It's a mark of infamy, disgrace. In medicine, which is, I work in a hospital, it's actually like a biomarker of disease. So more and more you see stigma <laughs> in a conversation about gay men and young queer individuals, transgenders, lesbians, whatever. I mean, in and of itself, the semantics is kind of fairly awful. <laughs> but um, in the work that we do, um, I'm at Children's Hospital. We do a lot of HIV care services for young people who are living with the virus already. Most of those are you know, young gay men. But on the sort of, I guess, brighter side of what we do at Children's, we um, are uh, an agency that's been committed probably since the early 90s to working with trans youth. Um, and it's something that I'm really proud of as a social worker that we get to do. But, and, I, and, and I think when you, you know, the work that we do in sort of trying to deal with issues of stigma, how that plays out in someone's lives and the violence is really thinking about how do we support both sort of creating a space that really acknowledges um, past trauma, uh, physical, psychological, people on this panel um, have talked about the violence in their own lives. Um, and so acknowledging that, giving support, but more, more than that is creating their own community. So creating a, a community of those peers, those young trans women, for example. Right now we have a project that uh, it's all about sort of how young people see themselves and it's you know, about legacy. So if you're told, if you're in a community that has stigma, whatever that means, um, who are told that they're immoral, deviant, less than, um, how do you then celebrate the amazing things that are in each of our communities? I mean, trans women, um, you know, open a history book. They're, they're the leaders in, the, in, in, our, in our fight for our own rights as gay men um, and have taken and had places of, you know, um, reverence in their own communities. And, and I think, you know, you, you ask a young trans woman who is working the boulevard and has been subjected to violence at the hands of their families and Johns and all, you know, lovers and everyone, to name someone in their community that's a strong, like a mentor, someone they can look up to. And it's really sad. Some of these young women, they're just blank stares, blank stares. And it's been amazing. We've been, you know, we invite people, and um, hopefully we'll have her in, um, to come and talk about their, their experiences. What have they accomplished? We all have a legacy. Each and every one of us has a legacy that we'll leave in life. And I think that's how we start to break down stigma in communities, is really celebrating the, the richness of who we are. I mean, um, so. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, now it's your turn. Um, there's a mic there, and is there a mic over here too? No, there's a mic there. Okay. So um, we've asked uh, John to come back on stage to be able to respond to, to questions. So um, please step up to the mics if you have a question and and don't be don't be intimidated I frequently find that people have lots of questions but they feel um, that people will judge them if they they're if it's appear ignorant and I'd rather you asked a stupid question than you went on and did a stupid thing because you didn't have the information you needed so uh, yes this question is for Miguel Martinez um, first of all, congratulations on your new little baby. Um, my question is whether or not you experienced this, what are some of the prejudices against um, gay men or lesbian women when uh, adopting a child through the system? I, I feel really blessed to live in LA County. Um, DCFS, for the right reasons or wrong reasons, who knows, is actively recruiting gay men and lesbians and transgenders to parent. Um, we have so many children in the system. But it's not to say that it's not without um, faults. <laughs> uh, again, it took us two years. Um, our child was placed with us when he was uh, seven days old. Um, we got the call when he was six days. Um, no family involvement, no visitations, you know, clear cut. 
Um, and so that's been the great part. DCFS is you know, good in that way. But in the working in systems, so as a gay man presenting, even at my own institution, Children's Hospital, um, with a child that doesn't look like me, my child is mixed. Uh, he's African American and white. Um, my partner is also Latino. Um, we're constantly asked questions, uh, questions about who the real parent is, where is this child's mother. I think there are particular um, challenges for gay men that women don't face, which is about, in our society, if you pick up uh, any parenting magazine, it's about women. You know, most parenting magazines, it's about how to take care of your child, if, um, how to you know, keep the flame alive in your relationship with your husband, uh, how, to, how to still look pretty as a woman who's, you know, parenting a child and the challenges. Um, we don't have that. Um, I think people are trying to create it. I think like the Gay and Lesbian Center has really good family services, but that's not a day-to-day -day experience. Um, on a at least weekly basis, I'm asked, again, where the mom is? Do I know how to take care of my child? Do I know why he's crying? And I'm like, well, two years later, he's not dead. Um, he's a really happy child. Uh, you know, I personally think he's amazing, but you know, I'm a little biased. So, so again, I, I think as social workers, I think it's important to, you know, we're in every system now. We're not relegated to HIV services. We're not just, I mean, you know, you're going to run into us in, if you're working in domestic violence, if you're working in the court systems, if you're working in, in foster care. So, um, but it's challenging. It's good. It's a, you know, if anyone's out there who wants to do it, DCFS has lots of kids. <laughs> do it. Thank you. Yes. Um, this is uh, to all the panel. But first of all, I want to thank you all for being so gracious to sharing all your experiences with us. And um, the question is actually to everybody in the panel. And um, it's basically, what would you advise an adolescent who is struggling to come out um, to their family and their friends? Like, what would be your advice talking to them? Who wants to start? <laughs> well, first of all, uh, what I would actually like to advise is not really to the, uh, to the child who wants to come out to their family. It would be much more to the parent. Because um, coming out is, is very difficult. Coming out, whether you're gay, but coming out to tell your parents that you are a girl or you are a boy, it's very, um, it's very difficult. What I would like to see is possible that parents will create an atmosphere where a child can, uh, can do that. And I can relate this back to my own experience. And I was um, about six years old. And one of our cousins were visiting. And the first thing you know, you introduce, you run out, introduce yourself. All the kids introduce. And they said, oh, you've got uh, four girls and three boys. And my mother said, no, that's my son. And it was the way she said it and how she said it, which continued to reinforce the fact that I knew that I would not be able to go and talk to her about it. So um, about the fact that it's saying to her that I'm actually a little girl, but there was no way, you know, because the environment wasn't there. Now, I come from a very loving home, but it was not there where I could go to my parents and say that uh, I'm, a, I'm a little girl. Um, it's very difficult for me to even, when I do speak to, uh, to, to youth about coming out and being transgender, it's, it's like you want to tell them that go ahead and tell your parents it's going to be okay. I can't do that. I cannot, I cannot sit up here and say to, to a 15-year-old and say, you know, you should go ahead, just go straight out and tell your parents. Because knowing the, other, uh, the options that could happen and the outcome, uh, being disowned, put on the streets, turned toward having to uh, prostitute yourself to survive and so forth. So uh, my advice is more to the parents to try to create 
a loving environment and not to ignore a child when you see signs of gender identity and give them a way they can come and actually come to you and talk to you about it. I do a, uh, a gay radio show, which I was saying, and our targeted audience is people that are coming out and the difficulties of it, no matter what age you are. Adolescents, it's harder because, you know, you are still a child and, and, and you're living under your parents' roof. Uh, and we have parents that also uh, contact us to ask us about resources, and there are resources out there. It, it, it is a tough it's a tough decision to come out to your parents and to your friends because it, you have to be comfortable with it within yourself. And, we, and it's not a time period. Everyone has to come out when they're ready to come out. And it's not always safe to come out. So you have to you know, use your uh, common sense on that. But I, there are many resources. There are support groups out there for adolescents, which we didn't have in the early 70s and 80s. So the schools now have support systems in their communities or in the schools themselves. So I would, as, as a social worker, I would really encourage you to, to look at these resources and see what's available in your community, because you'd be surprised how many that's just, just down the street from you that can help uh, with this process. And like I said, it, it's, you have to come out in your own time. Okay, I have a slightly different angle I think I want, I want to talk about. They, they used to talk about homosexuality as the love that dare not speak its name. Now it's the love that just won't shut up. Because, uh, you know, if you look at what's available today, uh, Will and Grace, Ellen DeGeneres, Rosie O'Donnell, you know, gay characters on TV, gay characters in the movie, I, there's so much uh, ability for people to identify compared to coming out in the 1970s like I did. And so I have a nephew and niece, and they're now uh, teenagers, 18 and 19. But when they were 12 or 13, their parents used to bring them to gay pride uh, with Uncle John. And so I, I said, they're 12. And they're, I mean, there's like, you know, buttocks sticking out of leather things and, you know. I mean, are you, am I, am I, thank God, my brother and sisters-in-law, they're very, you know, they're great. And they would come, so my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister, their kids, they would all come to Gay Pride. Okay, we, we had some rough spots, but for the most part, it was pretty ordinary. So one year, my nephew Anthony and niece said, we have a friend in high school, and we want to bring him to Gay Pride. We're pretty sure he's gay, Uncle John. So how, how can you tell? I mean, they're all like 15 at the time. How can you tell? Oh, you'll see. <laughs> and so they brought little Josh to Gay Pride. Oh, little Josh was gay. <laughs> you know, there was no mistaking the little Josh. But little Josh, being with his friends who were straight at Gay Pride, uh, probably saved him a decade of turmoil. <laughs> to just be there, he wasn't out yet, he's out now to them, but just to be with his peers who were okay with it was the reinforcement. I think that was so much more important, maybe even mom or dad, to have that peer support at an early age seemed to be most beneficial. I'll just throw that out. Hi, I have a question. I have a question. Um, this is directed to Neil, but any of the panelists that want to speak about this, I'd appreciate it. Um, I teach courses in grief and loss, and I wanted to find out from you what are the uh, loss issues that may not be as obvious to clinicians or to folks working with um, the community? Well, I think that you know, bereavement and loss is something that the lesbian and gay community, especially those of us who grew up in the AIDS pandemic years, um, have kind of worked through. Although I would say that I think many of us are in denial still about the hundreds and thousands of men that we lost to, to HIV and AIDS, and we still live in this kind of cloud of witness. And I think that's what World AIDS Day does for us, is it helps us to grieve that process one more time. Um, but I think anyone who goes through you know, loss of church, loss of family, loss of community, um, all of those losses um, compound one on top of the other. 
Um, and so, you know, when we're dealing with LGBT people, we may not just be dealing with one loss. You know, we could be dealing with multiple layers of loss that need to be, you know, psychologically dealt with um, and moved through. Um, so I would just uh, kind of just, again, really reinforce for us is that when we're dealing with LGBT people, we're not dealing with necessarily what's being presented. We need to take the time to really create an environment of safety that enables them to get in touch with some of the real deep issues that have affected their life. And that will take time because we don't trust people very much. We, you know, we're very, you know, we, we pretend we have lots and lots of acquaintances, but very, very few friends that we can really seriously trust because we've been rejected, because we've, we've had those multiple layers of loss. So, you know, this is, we, we, you know, we're, we're hard, but once you, once you, once you crack us, you know, we're the best friends you could ever have. My question is for Sharon, and this might be one of those naive questions, but um, I'm assuming when you were born on your birth certificate, they checked male. After the operation, were you able to change that? Like on your driver's license, does it say male, female? Uh, which one? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a lot of questions there. Um, and I'm going to have to respond to this in a certain way, and I'll tell you why, okay? Uh, but I will tell you what my license have on it, okay? It does have female on it, okay? But what I wanted to respond to this, why I will not answer that question, because for some reason, everybody automatically assumes, now I'm not going to answer one way or the other, that a person who is transgender must or will have or considered to have surgery. And for some reason, when an individual finds out that that transgender individual has not had surgery, their perception of that person changes. Not only does that, and by answering that question, does it affect how I may be perceived, but it's how you would perceive others who had not had the surgery or who choose not to have the surgery or who is... Uh, in the process. So uh, for that, the only way I will answer that is, as, as, as I mentioned before, is that simply my license says female, and yes, I was born uh, male on the birth certificate, mm -hmm. but the other that I want, and I hope you can understand why. I do. I guess my question while I'm asking also is I'm wondering, okay, if you were to marry a male, can you? Is it recognized by, I guess, legally recognized? Okay. If you've had the operation versus not having it. Well, when it comes to whether or not you're legally married, whether you have the operation or not, really doesn't matter. The reason for that is that you can have all the documentation, you can have all the surgeries, and, and you can marry. Mm -hmm. However, if it's a huge amount of money at stake and something happens to the, uh, the husband, dies, whatever, and if a family member wanted to contest what was left to you, in all the cases, the transsexual has lost because male is determined basically what your DNA is. So, and legally, that's same-sex marriage, when you break it down to that level. If there's not much money involved and no one knows, goes unnoticed, yes, you can legally marry. But technically, at the end of the day, according to where the laws are now, you're still marrying a male and a male or a female and a female. Thank you. I, I just want to add something to that because this is a really good point Sharon brings up. When in California in the legislature we were passing legislation to help uh, protect transgendered people from discrimination, we got little to no opposition from the usual opponents on gay rights legislation. So. After a while, after a few years, you see the same people in the Capitol all the time. So, you know, you have this weird sort of friendship that you talk to each other in the halls. And, and so I asked them, I said, why aren't you guys opposing the transgender protection bill? And, and they said, well, at least they're trying. <laughs> I was like, Try, trying what? Well, at least they're trying to fit into the proper male-female gender roles. <laughs> that was really an interesting thing to hear. Uh, and in terms of sort of analyzing homophobia and misogyny and sexism and where they all intersect, 
you can have a group of straight men who get together and they think lesbian sex scenes and porno is the hottest thing in the world. Yet you just flip the coin over, same sex male sex scenes, and oh God, oh, yeah, everybody starts to squirm and uh, people get very uncomfortable. And, and, and I have been brave enough to get in there with my heterosexual male friends to sort of dig a bit, you know, about what is that discomfort about. And more often than not, the comment is, well, he's, he's doing it like a, like a woman. And, and that, in and of itself, really shows just the effect of gender role, gender identity, and society's demand that you got to fit into gender A or gender B, and those who crisscross those lines, effeminate males, masculine women, I, you, that's dangerous stuff for some people in, in their heads. And it was just fascinating to me that the, you know, some of the fundamentalists right were saying, well, at least the trannies, at least they're trying to fit in. You guys, you're not even trying to fit into the gender roles. Uh, it was just an interesting thing in, in my head that I just wanted to add to what Sharon just said. I think, I think many people will say that homophobia at its base is just sexism, um, that it, it's, a, it's a challenge to the traditional uh, notions of of a male and female, and if a male is being penetrated, um, then he's behaving as a, as a female. So um, a lot of people just see homophobia, as, in essence, as, as fundamentally sexism. This question is for the panel. Um, as SWITS social workers in training and doing our internships at, in clinical settings, I just wanted to know what your recommendation or advice or any personal experience is. If you have a client that you perceive to be homophobic and does ask you about either your gender orientation or your sexual orientation, do we as SWITS, if we are uh, LGBTQ squared, um, if we do the don't ask, don't tell because we can't disclose that much, and what's our gender identity um, legal protection? in the profession of social workers. Mikhail? I wouldn't answer the question. I, I think I would ask them why it was so important that they know the answer to that question and what, how does that impact them. I think, you know, and, and, and with any personal questions, if you turn it back to the client or the person that's sitting in front of you, it's like, it's about you, it's not about me. But I, I, I have a little different point of view. We tell our, our interns that, as Miguel suggests, you, Generally speaking, you never respond to a direct question with a direct answer, but you explore the meaning of the question uh, for the client. And frequently in that exploration, you find you don't have to provide an answer, that there's no, there's no need. On the other hand, I, don't, I, I think it, it can send essentially a homophobic message if you refuse to disclose that, especially if you are gay, to a client um, who asks. Now, there are some clients that you may assess it's, for this client, it would be inappropriate for me to give that information. Um, but um, aside from that, I think there's no reason not to, uh, to share that information once you've explored the meaning and what would the answer mean, mean to you and what if I was straight, what if I was gay. Um, then um, if, the, if the client persists, then I see no reason uh, not to share it. And there's no legal liability you're under by, by disclosing your sexual orientation. <laughs> Why should that stop you? All right. There's probably, I'm aware of that, um, several reasons. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people who are not The question had to do with the, the number of, of uh, uh, gay lesbian uh, individuals who are having bearing children via in vitro uh, fertilization and if, if whether or not 
um, that is going to become a, a, a psychological issue for, for children in the future. I just wonder if it would be the same. I mean, I think in vitro fertilization is a, it's a part of our society now. I think there are a lot of straight couples actually that, and you know, for, for lots of reasons. I, I mean, I think there are definitely challenges to the idea of, um, you know, my high school girlfriend, who's a lesbian, surprise. Um, <laughs> she, uh, her, her and her partner, uh, went through a similar, similar circumstance and, you know, they went through a whole thought process of do I choose a person who's in, do they choose someone that's in their lives, um, like one of their many gay friends, gay male friends, um, or do they go with someone who's anonymous and, and what, how will they answer those questions in the future? I mean, I think, um, you know, whether it's adoption or in vitro, I, I think that as parents were, you know, if we're open with our children and thoughtful about those answers, um, I mean, certainly, I'm sure, you know, it could be an issue for a particular person, but I don't think it'll be any necessarily more challenging than um, a young person who's the byproduct, I don't know what the right word is, of in vitro fertilization and from a man and a woman. I, I, don't, I don't know. I think one of the um, similarities or challenges who this is going to be facing uh, along the same line is that there are a large number of transgender individuals that assimilate very well. And the, what I think you're going to be facing is their children and at what age do they tell their children that they're actually transgender and whether or not uh, uh, how to deal with those children and whether or not the other family knows. So it's kind of like you know, it's going to be up to, um, it's, I think it's a difficult task, but I think it's going to be much more, um, you're going to see much more of it, much prevalent as we continue to move on because those of us who assimilated into society 20 years ago, we're starting to come out to the forefront. And one of those issues is that how do we tell our kids that, you know, they weren't, you know, they weren't conceived, but, you know, so how do we do that? And at the same time, how do we let your spouse parents or your partner parents know that you can't bear children, you know, because of the fact that you're transgender? Here's some hope. <laughs> We're living in a very different world. And the children that are growing up today are radically different from the children that I remember I was. And in 10 years' time, when some of these children will be getting to that age, we would have had 10 years of a democratic government um, that would have made some <laughs> radical changes in our country. Oh, did I say who I vote for? Oh. Um, who... Um, <laughs> Um, who, you know, who, who will have a very different environment, a very different culture, and you know, we will be living in a queer world. And by that, what I mean is that the dominant culture that we have today will be long and gone and dead and buried, and we will have a culture that will be radically inclusive and self-loving, and it won't matter whether I've got two moms, two dads, whether I was born of one or the other, whether I've got a transgendered parent, uh, we will be living in a very bisexual, very bicultural world, uh, one that uh, God intended it to be right at the very beginning, and we're a part of that process, so. <laughs> okay. Hi, one, um, thank you for taking the time out to come out and talk to us. Your stories were really inspirational. Two, I'm Mormon and I'm not white, as you can tell. <laughs> three, yeah, three, um, nature versus nurture. You know, it's, it's a constant question, you know, it's bickered about. Just in your opinion, you know, just personal experiences, do you believe, you know, they're just born with the tendencies or do you think, you know, environment influences or do you think it's both? <laughs> okay. Why would I choose to be persecuted? You know, 
I, I think about my own profession, and you know, um, you know, I have a congregation in West Hollywood, uh, approximately 500 people. You know, I'm told constantly by my colleagues in the evangelical conservative wing of the church that if I would just go back into the closet, I could have a congregation of 5,000, 10,000, and be a mega church pastor. That's too much of a price to pay. I am, by nature, homosexual. Um, and, be, and it's not because of nature. I have five brothers and one sister. I have an identical twin brother who's married with four children. Uh, we were grown up in exactly the same environment, exactly the same time, in exactly the same period of history. Um, now, of course, I think he's bisexual, but, you know. <laughs> um, but but he's, he, he self-identifies as heterosexual, and so, as a good professional, I'll go with his own self-definition of who he is. Um, now, having said all of that, I do believe that some people are confused about sexuality. And, you know, um, environmental you know, issues can, can play into that. And our job is to create an environment where people can feel comfortable when they make that final decision for themselves. But my understanding of my orientation is, God damn it, I was made gay and thank God for it. <laughs> <laughs> I just said something about that. So Thanksgiving time at the Duran house is always really fun because my mother and father have four children. I'm the eldest, liberal Democrat. My next brother, conservative Republican. My next brother, Democrat, very radical, sort of almost bordering on hippie druggy. And my baby sister, who is a born-again Christian Republican. So we all get together for Thanksgiving once a year, right? And it's just like everything. It's like, oh, dear God, we just got to get through this because this is going to always be. And so, um, you know, one Thanksgiving, one of my little nephews, we were, I mean, we were just there, grown-ups having a talk, completely oblivious to the fact there's children in the room, right? We're just talking, politics, and, ah, newspaper, ah. And so we're sitting there, and we're starting to eat, and little Ryan comes running up. At this time, maybe seven or eight. And we're sitting there, and he's listening. And finally, as I'm about to take a bite of my turkey, little Ryan says, Mom, what's gay? <laughs> Uncle John is just about ready to spit out his turkey and gravy. Because I'm really not sure how to answer this question at this moment with, you know, and, and my sister's there, and, you know, fundamentals Christian Republican, and I think, oh, God, here we go. Hang on. It's going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> and my grand and mom, mother, grandmother just says, honey, gay is when two people of the same sex love each other like your mommy and daddy love each other. Pass the potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, so I don't have to do anything. And, and my sister and brother are kind of in checkmate because grandma has spoken. Yeah, you know, nobody's going to cry. And so after we leave, I, I, you know, everyone calms down a little. I must me calm down a little. I say, Mom, Mom, that you handled that brilliantly. I mean, you know, is that what you do when people say, you know, how do you handle having a gay son? And she goes, oh, I just tell them I have no problem having a gay son. It's just having a Republican son has been so <laughs> difficult. <laughs> I have a question. Okay, um, th and this will be our, our, I'm sorry, it'll be our last question of, of the day. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> I have a question, and forgive me ahead of time, because it's been going through my head how to convey it, but how do you address um, adolescents who, I have a 19-year-old sister who has friends that don't identify as gay, but in her high school it was considered the fad to dress and be more feminine for the males, and the females to dress masculine, but they did not identify with being gay or having um, any gender issues, but clearly to anyone else, you can see it. And parents trying to figure out how to um, address it with their teenager without shutting them out, because if they're not, they're saying they're not gay, but it's presented in another way. How do you address that with these adolescents? Because it's really a huge fad going on right now, particularly within the African-American community. Miguel? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think it's more than just the African-American community. I, I live in Highland Park, um, which, you know, when I moved there, I thought, 
huh, interesting neighborhood, cool, you know, it's great. And, and seeing young people on their way to high school with skinny pants and long hair. And when I was a teenager, I can't even imagine. God, you would have, <laughs> you would have been beat up and <laughs> thrown in the dumpster. Um, but, <laughs> but I think, you know, I think it raises a really good point in some of the discussions today, which is that's gender expression. It's not really sexuality. I mean, if I choose, uh, actually, one of my really good college mates who married a woman, uh, went to school every day at Berkeley in a, in a dress with long purple hair on a scooter. Um, he's now married to a woman. They live in Pasadena. They work for JPL, and they have three kids. Like, so whether it's, you know, I mean, I think as a parent, is it, is it as long as they're not harming themselves, do, you know, I think the, the message should always be unconditional love. How do I accept you? How do I support you in keeping yourself safe if people are beating you up? But outside of that, you know, Tell them to get a job so they can pay for their own clothes if you don't like them. But other than that, I think it's not our place. So. And I took one last question, and then we have to. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I am a very straight woman um, who was in her 40s. I'm in my 40s and lost very, a lot of friends in the 80s. Um, a very good friend of mine died alone and ashamed. And I love gay men, and I love gay women. However, my intentions are often misunderstood. I have a lot of compassion. I'm very spiritual, not religious. And so my question to you is, and I've done a lot of volunteer work in hospice care, and so my question is, how, um, how would you suggest I approach people in their hour of pain and grief and transition and be more understood and that there's a difference between sympathy and, com you know, compassion is love, unconditional love. So I'm, I'm, my experience is that some gay men and women don't understand that and don't understand my intentions. So how would you suggest I work on that? Fred, you want to do that? I'll try. Um, yeah, in our, in our dying hours of need, we want people around us who love us and who will uncompassion, you know, unconditionally hold us and, and be with us in those hours of transition. I'm, I'm trying to work out how you might be misunderstood um, in those closing acts, is it? I think sometimes people un don't understand compassion. Compassion is not pity. You know, you identify, because my friend, I had a very good friend, Sean Ray, he died in 1988, and he died in a hospital in Washington, D.C., alone, afraid, ashamed. The hospital was cold and dark and dank. His grandmother was there crying and grieving, and so he couldn't have a moment. He couldn't be with himself. And so as a result of that, I am drawn to those situations and being of service to people, but sometimes people don't understand what that really means because they haven't had that support from their own family. And I think that's the issue. It's not about you, it's about them. Um, and the reality is that most, you know, most of us who have gone through these experiences, you know, we get to our dying beds and we, it's too late. Um, and you know, we have internalized homophobia going on, we have internalized heterophobia going on, let's be honest, but you know, for the, those of us in the gay community, we're sometimes fearful of straight people because you're the oppressor. Um, and I don't mean that in this room, none of us. Um, but you know, we, we've, and, and so it, it's, it's really not about you. And so if that is your gift, then offer it unconditionally, whether it's misunderstood or not, and just allow the person who is in that process and not really knowing how to deal with this, and let them be with that too, because that's part of the gift of the, of the discomfort. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I think all of us want things tied up in nice little packages before we move on, but the fact of the matter is sometimes it, it's, not as, it's not as comfortable, it's not tied up as nicely. Um, so it's your gift, keep offering it, keep giving it out there, because we need it, and we need to deal with our own stuff, too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you all. Again, I'm sure you'd agree this has been a tremendously wonderful day. And um, we'd like to thank our keynote speaker again. So let's give a round of applause. Most keynote speakers, they deliver their speech and they can't wait to leave. 
So it's very nice to see John still sitting here. Thank you, John. I'd also like to thank Ian, who has done a tremendous job. As our moderator, we're never quite sure with moderators, and we've had a few, and so, but this one is fantastic. Thank you very much. And we'd like to thank the panel, who is just absolutely amazing. They've shared with us their defining moments, and they're also giving us food for thought, which is very encouraging to know that we have people in the community that cares about everyone. So a round of applause for all our panelists. Thank you. And in future, we know who to ask to come and speak to us because we have already got them hooked. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to also thank the committee who has helped to put this together and to make it such a successful day. Could the committee please stand? The All School Day Committee. Thank you. Without them, we would never have achieved this day. They have been absolutely brilliant, and I thank them so much. Before we close, there's a few um, things that I must say that, you know, that, so that the whole thing ends quite well. And one of those is to ensure that you fill out your evaluation forms. And there are various different um, boxes at each side that people should fill the evaluation form. Please don't leave without you fill out the evaluation form. It's very important. And please place it in the box. Thank you. And I'd like to introduce, oh, before I do that, Elizabeth's got something to say. And I'd like to introduce also David and Elisa because they have something to say also. So would you mind coming this way? This, this whole day, Thank you. Wow, you're known. <laughs> well, this whole day is going to be a continuation. Well, this half a day is going to be a continuation. And it's going to hopefully go into our classrooms and the discussion will continue. So it's not going to be a day when everyone forgets what's been said here today. It is something that is very meaningful to our lives, our social workers, but to our lives in general. So it's important to us as people and what we actually give to our society. So we have two very important people here, who you know, who is just going to explain to you other things that we are actually doing. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, well, my name is David Hoxie. I'm with the Rainbow Alliance. I'm here with Alicia Hooten, who is also with the Rainbow Alliance Social, Social Work Caucus. Um, we have a few events that will be going on uh, this month that we'd like to kind of highlight. First and foremost, we'd like to invite everyone to the, the informal groups that Dean Flynn mentioned at the beginning. Um, they'll be taking place at Orange County campus, uh, University Park and also City Center. So please take advantage of those. I believe Dr. Yamada emailed those out to everyone. Um, and then also Alicia has something to say. Um, we are having a general meeting. I don't really want to stand on my tiptoes. Um, we're having a general meeting on Tuesday, next Tuesday the 12th, uh, in MRF 204 um, at 11.15 to 12.30. We're going to um, there's, I mean, we can process this further, but we're also going to be talking about um, just further issues, things that we're going to be covering for the semester. If you guys want to get more involved, um, that would be a really good place to do it. Also, we are having a brown bag the following um, Tuesday, which is the 19th in Hamovich. From 11 to 1, we're going to be um, collaborating with the International Social Work Caucus, and we're going to be showing a documentary on um, coming out in the developing world. 
Um, it's a really good movie. We're going to have a discussion, um, and we're going to eat food. So uh, come join us. That's it. Um, everyone, the, the lunches, before Elizabeth speaks, the lunches are out these doors. Um, so pick a side and get your lunch. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I don't want to be belabor you. I know you're ready to get off to lunch. Um, one of the things that I did want to clarify in terms of the afternoon session, for those students who are in their foundation year, I wanted to just let you know which students need to stay for the afternoon since this is a full day for many of you. For the students that are in, in your 586B, 587A, which is your integrative seminar and your field placement, want to make sure that you return here at 1 today in order to begin preparation for checking in so that we can begin the program promptly at 1.15 so that you can get the concentration selection presentations this afternoon. So if there are additional questions, I will be back in the foyer. If you're not able to attend, please let me know. But at this point, all students who are in the foundation year field and seminar are required to attend this event. Thank you again for the panelists today. It's been a wonderful day. And please do not forget to do your evaluations. Very important. For those of you, just one more minute, let me just say this. For those of you who may be uh, going to classes this afternoon at 4 o'clock, Dr. Yamada wanted me to let you know that there will be the first brown bag session today at 4 p.m. in Hamovich Research Center. So please join Dr. Yamada and the committee that's put this together so that you can have some additional dialogue in regards to these issues. Thank you.